Good evening. Let us stand for the reading of God's holy word. Tonight's reading is coming out of Genesis, the 19th chapter, verses 15 through 17 and 23 through 26. Again, that's Genesis, the 19th chapter, verses 15 through 17 and 23 through 26. And I'm coming out of the NIV. And it reads, With the coming of dawn, the angels urged Lot, saying, Hurry, take your wife and your two daughters, who are here, or who are here, or you will be swept away when the city is punished. When he hesitated, the men grasped his hand and the hands of his wife and his two daughters and led them safely out of the city. For the Lord was merciful to them. As soon as they had brought them out, one of them said, flee for your lives. Don't look back, don't stop anywhere in the plain. Flee to the mountains or you will be swept away. 23, by the time Lot reached Zor, the sun had risen over the land. The Lord rained down brimstone sulfur on Sodom and Gomorrah from the Lord out of heaven. Thus, he overthrew those cities and the entire plain, including all those living in the cities and the vegetation in the land. But Lot's wife looked back and she became a pillar of salt. Let us pray. Lord, Heavenly Father, we come to you, Lord. Father God, I surrender all to you. Father God, I humble myself and I submit to you. Lord, I ask of you, Father God, to, to love, just speak through me. Allow your word to do its job. Father God, allow it to touch who it's meant to touch tonight, Father God. Lord, we pray, Father God, for a change. Father God, we've already said yes. Now, Father God, allow that yes to convict the hearts, Father God, of us on anything that you will speak through this message tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The message tonight, the title of tonight's message is Don't Look Back. You know, so many times we have the tendencies when God says something to look back. Now here in verse 15 and 16, we see that when the angel of the Lord told Lot and his wife to leave, the first thing we see is they hesitated. Now this didn't come from somebody, this came from the angel of the Lord. So they knew who it was who was speaking. How many times have God told us to do something and we hesitate? We stand still before we move. Now, the word Gomorrah, I want you to catch this. The word Gomorrah means overwhelmed. The word Zor means insignificance. See, sometimes God has to take us out of our overwhelmed to put us in a place of insignificance. Remember when God pulled Moses out of Egypt, he pulled him out of overwhelmed and left him in the wilderness for 40 years. To Moses, that was insignificance on everything he has ever known. But it was a training ground. His insignificance was a training ground. When God puts us into a place of insignificance, it's always for a purpose. Now, when he got Moses where he needed him, he told him, now, I need you to go back and free my people. Now, when the Israelites come out, he says, take them to Mount Sinai where I will meet you. 
when the Israelites get there, the first thing they do is they look back. They start complaining. Have you brought us out here, Moses, to die? At least there, we had what we needed. But see, when God takes you there, he's taking you there to humble you. He's taking you there to, for you to submit to him. He's taking you there to get you to listen. But now see, from Mount Sinai to, to Israel was only a 10-day journey. And it was a journey that they never made. Why? Because they did not learn what they needed to learn in insignificance. If we don't learn in insignificance, that is where we stay. See, God's, see, God puts us, God takes us out of our overwhelmed. Now, like Pastor teaches, he creates our destiny, then he creates us for our destiny. So in that process, he has to put us in a place of insignificance to get us ready for our destiny. Because if he put us there too quickly, it would destroy us and overwhelm us. And every time God's going to put us somewhere, he's got to take us into a place to where we ask. And how many times have we asked God, why have you put me here? Why have you placed me here? Why? How many times have we asked God that question, Lord, why me? Why not you? See, he's got you in a place to where there's nothing going on. And a lot of times in your insignificance, God says nothing. God will be silent. God will be silent. Now let's go to point number one. Point number one is who are you listening to? See, at Mount Sinai, one thing God teaches us is to listen. There are things that have voices. Doubt has a voice. Depression has a voice. Anger has a voice. Unforgiveness has a voice. Whatever you listen to most, you submit to. Think of that. Whatever voice you listen to, that's who you submit to. So are you submitting to the enemy or are you submitting to God? Who are you listening to when that man called you up last week? Who are you listening to when that woman called? Who are you listening to when you went to the casino? Who are you listening to when you took your tithe money and paid your bills with? Who are you listening to? See, these things have voices. These things have voices. Now, some people say, well, I have a good relationship with God, so I know how to listen to him. Let me give you an ex Let me break it down to you like this. When you go and meet somebody for the first time, you have to grab their attention. So you get their number, you call them up, and you talk on the phone for hours. Everybody's done it. We talk on the phone for hours, and nobody wants to get off the phone with each other. You get off the phone, then you call back 10, 15 minutes later. And why? Because you're getting to know their voice. You're getting to know that person's voice. Now, then you start taking them out. You ask them, hey, you know, I want to take you out to dinner. Why? Because you're trying to get to know them personally. You're getting to know them intimately. Okay, now that's in the natural, but let's put this in the spiritual. When we listen to God, we're building that relationship. Okay, well, how do we get God's phone number? Repentance. Repentance is the first way to grab God's attention. If you're not repenting, you're not grabbing his attention. You will not grab God's attention just by calling. You have to have permission to call him. And repentance allows you, repentance allows you that number to have direct contact. Now, okay, you got his number. 
Now what you have to do is you have to call him on a regular basis. How is it we can call up a man or a woman and spend three or four hours, but we can't spend an hour in prayer with God? See, we can't spend that kind of time because we allow, again, we're allowing the TV, we're allowing phones, we're allowing all of these voices to distract us from our rebuilding a relationship with our Father. Now, how do you date God? How do you, how do you get to know God intimately? The Constitution. Because everything you need to know about God, his habits, his likes, his dislikes, right there. But we don't want to do that. Why? Because self-examination. See, because when we really crack this word open, God's going to show you you. But see, he's going to show you your mess that you're hiding from everybody. Because see, God needs a relationship with us. And the only way that we're going to hear his voice is if we get rid of all the mess that we're burying, that we're hiding. See, I don't want no one to know what I got inside. See, like, Minister Alvin's taught the men's meeting. We portray to have a mask on. Because, see, we don't want no one to know. But, see, we say we have a relationship with God, but in reality, we don't. Listen to what it says in Jeremiah 33 and 3. It says, call on me and I will answer you and tell you great and hidden things that you have not known. The reason why we don't call on him because we don't know him. You can't call on somebody you don't know. Now, some people will sit and say, well, I know God's voice. I have a relationship with God. God always speaks through his word. That is true. But let me mess with you. Just because it's word don't mean it's God. Now, now follow me. I'll prove this. When Jesus was baptized, the Holy Spirit led him in the wilderness for 40 days and he fasted. Now at the end of this, if you go through the end of this, the Bible says he took him on the highest pinnacle. And he says, this is scripture, he, Satan says, cast yourself down from here for his angels have given, you, given him charge over you, at least you dash your foot against the stone. Now he just quoted the scripture so just because it's word don't mean it's God. Just because it's word does not mean it's God. Because see, the Bible says that Satan comes as, as an angel of light. That means he comes in appearance. How can Satan come in a, an appearance of God himself? Don't forget where he came from. Don't forget where Satan came from. He spent majority of his eternity, most of his life in the presence of God. So he knows how to mimic. He knows how to mimic the light. And the Bible also says that he comes as a roaring lion. There's only one lion, the Bible says, and that's the lion of Judah. So see, Satan knows how to mimic everything. That's why we need to learn to listen to what the Holy Spirit is saying. That's why we got to get in our constitution. That's why we have to get on our face before him and say, Lord, allow me to hear your voice. See, the Bible says also that my sheep hear my voice. A stranger's voice they do not hear. Some people are deceived. Why? Because they're not God's sheep. See, there's a lot of people sitting in, in churches that's going to die and bust hell wide open. And fact is fact. Why? Because they just go into church to check it off their list, say, okay, I went to church. They come in one way and they come out the same way because there's no change. There's no difference. Why? Because they're not listening. They're not reading. They're not allowing the word to work in their life. Now, let's go to point A, under point, under point number one. Point A is the flesh. Now, this is something that we all have to deal with on a daily basis. There's nothing that we can get out of. The only way that we're going to get out of it is if we're laying in a box right there. 
That's the only way that we're going to quit dealing with flesh. As long as we have breath in our bodies, we have to deal with flesh. Now listen to what it says in Ephesians 6 and 12. And this is out of the King James, so it's going to be a little different. And it says, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. Now, I read that for a reason, because see, our warfare, it starts in heaven first. Then it manifest in the natural. To see, anything that happens has to start in the spiritual realm first. Then it manifests in the spirit, in the natural realm. So why do we not, why do we not stop it there before it gets here? Because we're not listening to what God says. Everything that God has for us tells us how to stop it there so it don't affect us here. Everything that we, and we deal with things like anger, unforgiveness. We deal with drugs, alcohol, pornography. We deal with you know, everything and anything we deal in the natural flesh. How many times does somebody cut us off and the first thing we do when they, when they drive right past us, we're either flipping them off or we're cussing them out. And that person can't hear you, but that's flesh. That is flesh. So see, the flesh is something that is a dangerous tool because that's why we have to bring that flesh under subjection to the Holy Spirit. And the only way we can do that is with a pure heart. Because see, when we have a pure heart and we truly mean what we say, we'll bind up our flesh on a daily basis. We'll bring it under subjection. We'll leave it at the cross. Listen to what it says in John 8 and 36. John 8 and 36 says, So if the Son sets you free, you are free indeed. So many of us are not free because we won't open up our mouth and ask God for help. Because we're not listening to what he has to say. Some of the stuff that we go through could be avoided if we learn to listen and stop looking back. Because see, we look back too much, so therefore, when God speaks, we're not listening because we're listening to what's behind us. We're listening to our past. We're listening to everything that we've dealt with. Point B is crucifying the flesh. Now, listen to what it says in, five, in Galatians 5 and 24. It says, and those who are Christ's have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. We have to crucify everything in this world that we deal with. Like, I'm going to use unforgiveness as, as an example. And I'm going to use my life as that example. I had to deal with unforgiveness for a long time. I had bitterness and hatred. And it was the only one I came here where I got free from it. I had spent most of my life with this anger and this hatred. And this anger and hatred was towards my family. Knowing part of my story, I'm going to tell you a part of my story. Growing up in the 70s and in the 80s, my mother would take my brother to the mall and buy him designer clothes and everything he needed. 50 to $75 pair of shoes back then was like two $300 shoes now. Me, she would go to Goodwill and get my clothes. My shoes was already tearing up that she would bring home for me. This is what I wore on a daily basis. This is what I had to forgive, especially when I hear my friends say, hey, why don't you dress like your brother? You know, why are you dressing like a bum for? I couldn't say nothing. What could I say? But this is what I lived with all of my life. I had to deal with this, and it became a bother for me to even call her, to even hear her voice, 
because I had so much anger, so much hatred built up in her. But when I came here to the men's encounter, my first time, they had what we call a proxy. And, and if y'all have never been to a men's encounter or a women's encounter, I urge you, there is freedom. There is deliverance. There is healthy coming from there. Because it was that proxy that I stood there and I explained my story, what was going on. And I saw my family standing right there. And I had to forgive it all. Why? Because if I don't forgive, then I can't reach my destiny. And if I don't forgive, that unforgiveness keeps me looking back. See, that unforgiveness will keep me looking back because I can't, you cannot go forwards any other time with it. But see, a lot of times the reason why we don't take stuff to God is because we don't trust God. We don't trust God. And you know why? Because we've prayed prayers. We've talked to him. Said, Lord, I need you to do this for me. I need your help. And God don't answer. Why don't God answer? Number one, it may not be time. Number two, because see, just because, like Pastor says, denied, I mean, delayed, don't mean denied. See, there's things that God has to get out of you before he answers that prayer because he knows that if the mess that you're dealing with, if he answers that prayer with the mess still in you, it's going to contaminate everything he's trying to do for you. It will contaminate everything. Look at a seed. We hear the story all the time, you plant a seed. And it's in the Bible, you plant a seed and it grows. We plant a seed in good soil. Well, now think of this here. We can take a good seed, plant it in bad soil. And the product of that soil, the contaminants in that soil, will do one of two things. It will either allow that seed to grow and therefore you have bad fruit. Or the seed will remain dead and never sprout. So see, that's why it's so crucial that the mess that we have in us, we have to make sure that we're good soil because we cannot allow the contaminants of our body to hinder our seed. Because see, God's trying to get, if God can get it to us, he can get it through us. But some so many times he can't get it to us because of the junk that we're having. Now I'm gonna explain, now watch this. When we come down, and the, Bible, and the scripture says it, that when we crucify the flesh, we crucify the flesh with its passions and desires. So many times we come down here, we leave flesh right here on the altar. Then we go back to our seat, but that's not biblical. What did the scripture say? You crucify the flesh and the passions and desires. If you take the passion and desire back with you, the flesh is going to sit right here and still live. That flesh will never die without. See, it takes passion and desire to kill flesh. But see, so many times we hold on to passion and desire. Why? Because we think we can't live without this. Because we're so accustomed to having this with us on a daily basis. So when we come down here, if we're not going to bring passion and desire and flesh, we might as well stay right there because this ain't going to do us no good. This will do us no good if long, if we keep picking up passion and desire and taking it back to our seat because the only thing flesh is doing is say, okay, I'm going to wait till you get back there. I'm going to wait till you get home and I'm going to come follow you right back where you were. But see, that's all it's going to do. It's going to get up from here and follow you right on back to your car and then you're going to wonder, well, well, I left that there. Yeah, you left that there, but you didn't leave passion and desire with it. Because see, the the Bible says that a threefold cord is not easily broken. You have flesh, passion, desire. A threefold cord right there. If you leave them all three right there, they got to do nothing but die. They have to do nothing but die. Yes, 
Now let's go to point C, under point number one, and that's action. See, action is one of them words that we don't like fooling with. Action is one of them words that when it comes biblically, we try to avoid. Because action means work. Action means work. We don't want to work at this. We want things given to us. The society that we're living in, it's a microwave society. That means, okay, I need to ask God for a quick fix and I'm gone. But that ain't the way God works. God says, if you want me, I'm going to make you work for me. I'm going to make you work to find me. I'm going to make you work to find it. Because when you find him, he's going to tell you, okay, I need you to leave unforgiveness. I need you to leave the casino. I need you to leave alcohol, unforgiveness, hatred, anger, depression. I need you to leave all of that at the altar. When you find me, this is what he's going to tell you that you need to do. Now listen to what it says in James 2, 14 through 17. Now this is coming out of the ESV version, and it says, What good is it, my brother, if someone says that she has faith but but doesn't have works? Can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, And one of you say to them, go in peace and be warm and filled without giving them the things needed for the body. What good is that? So also, faith by itself, faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. That word works, works, that's an action word. That means you have to put some momentum behind that. But see, we don't want to work at this thing because we want God to come down. We want to come to church. We want God to come down, give us what we need, and we're fine. This way we can still live in our, live in our mess. Why? Because our mess is painful. See, Jesus says, take upon my yoke, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Why? Because he knows that the mess that we've been through, it's painful And he wants to take it away from us. But we don't want to work to give it to him. We don't want to work at it. Because when we work at it, what happens is, then we start dealing, then we start crying. And and men, we're taught, we're taught men, we ain't never supposed to cry. Because we've all heard it, boy, shut up. Shut up before I give you another. I'll give you something to cry about. That's what we're taught as men. That's That's real. That's what we're taught as men. Men are taught you can't cry. So why is it different for men and women? Because women are taught that they release stuff, that they're they're natural releasers of emotions. Men, that's uncommon to us. That's why it's hard for us as men to work at this thing more than it is women. Because when we're shown what we are and what was truly inside of us, we don't want to deal with the pain. We just want to bury it. That's the reason why some people are alcoholics and drug addicts. Because I tell you now, that's the reason why I was a drug addict. Why I was an alcoholic for. Why? Because I wanted to bury that pain of all the anger and the unforgiveness. At 19 years old, I could drink most men under the table. I was drinking two or three fists just to get a buzz. Why? Because I was trying to bury the pain and the anger and the hatred that I had on the inside of me. But it was when I decided to do the work here. Because I was getting proper teaching here. I was getting everything, I was getting substance. I just wasn't getting a light word with a little bit of sh- with, with a little bit of meat on it and a whole bunch of sugar. No, that's not what I needed. I needed something that's gonna make me transform, something that was gonna make me change, so I'm comfortable with who it with who I'm with to with getting rid of my mess. Because I have somebody, I have, I have my brothers to lean on, I got my brothers to cry on. And I've done it. And I've, and I've leaned on my brothers. I've cried with, my, with one of my brothers before. I've, I've opened up to them. That's because I had to work at this. So, 
what am I saying on this point right here about this scripture? We can come to the altar, but never come to the altar. We come to the altar, but never come to the altar. We come down in appearance, but our heart, our emotions, everything that we're dealing with stays right back there. We come here for a show. We come here, we come here to say, Pastor, look at me. See, Pastor? See, Pastor, see me? I'm coming down to the altar. Pastor don't care. Well, Pastor does care, but he cares about your soul. He wants you to come down here for a reason. He wants you to be transformed. He wants you to be renewed in your mind. That's why when we come to the altar, we got to make sure that we come to the altar with a pure heart, with something that means something, just like the alabaster box. Why was, that, why was that put in there for? Because that was precious to her. That was something that she could have sold for money to get herself away. But what did she do? She gave it to God himself. And what happened? She's been immoralized in the scripture for all eternity. For everybody to know. She sacrificed something because she saw a greater need. See, she saw the greater need with that alabaster box. She says, I could keep this, but I'm going to sacrifice it. So many times, we don't want to sacrifice something when we come to the altar. But I'll tell you, if you, if you bring that thing that you precious and cherish most, because we all have something that we cherish that we really don't want to deal with, and this I'll make you a promise tonight. If you come to this altar and you truly get rid of it tonight, God will reward you for it in some way or fashion because the thing that God will place on the inside of you will be far greater than the mess that you're dealing with now. Now listen to what it says in Psalms 55 and 22. It says, cast your burdens on the Lord. And he will sustain you. He will never allow the righteous to be moved. Now listen again. Here's that word. Here's that action word. Cast. That word means to throw. Like the fishermen, when they would throw their nets. The Bible said they would cast their nets. They have to throw them. It's a it's a process because they have to first pick it up. So many times we don't want to pick up our mess. We see it. We don't want to pick it up because, see, it's a, it's a process. We have to pick up the net. Then we have to throw the net and allow the net to fall where it lies. See, just like our mess, to keep us from looking back, we have to sacrifice that. We have to pick it up. We have to acknowledge what it is, and then we have to say, God, I'm leaving this here. I'm leaving this anger, and if it's anger or resentment or whatever it is, okay, Lord, now here's this part of it. Now here's the reasons why. Right Here's the reasons why I have this. This is the reasons. You're leaving the reasons and the prop and the... And the unforgiveness or hatred, then it dies. It stays here. But see, what we have to do is, the Bible says that whatsoever you bind on earth is bound in heaven. And whatsoever you loosen on earth is loosed in heaven. So what do we have to do? Again, it's work. When we bring it down here to this altar, and we leave that, and we leave the stuff that caused this, then we have to bind it up from ever leaving here. We, because see, if we loose it, if we don't bind it up, it has all authority to follow us right on back to our seat. See, we, why we have to stop it here. We got to stop it here. We got to bind it up right here. Then we got to loosen God to allow God to do the work on the inside of us. Because see, that's where the pain, that's where the work is going to come in at. Because see, then when God, when you bind it up here, when you bind up all of it here, it can't leave. Because it's under the blood. It's under the word of God. And the Bible says that his word shall not return to him void. That means when you put it here, 
and you tell him what his word says, God has to honor that. And God says, okay, that stays there. That stays there. That stays, that stays there right there. You can't do that. Now, the only way, the only way that this is going to come back, if you get up out of your seat and come back here and pick this back up. But you may not be here. You say, well, I, well what about if I'm not there to pick it back up? Well, what about if that thought comes back to you or that anger? May it be anger towards a parent or a friend or, or unforgiveness for somebody. It starts to come back up. There's a voice. There's that voice. No, I left that at the altar. I bind that up in Jesus' name. I rebuke that in the name of Jesus. That's at the altar. That can't go nowhere. See, there's a work process. There's allowing God to move in your life because now you don't want that mess back. Why? Because you have the sense of freedom. You have that freedom, and that freedom says that you enjoy this. You're enjoying this. Now let's go to point number two. Point number two is follow. Now, we've done the action. We've, we learned to listen. We've acknowledged the flesh. We've crucified our mess at the cross. We've done the work. Now, we have to know who we're following. Because I want to tell you, who we're following, if they're not in perfect line with the Father, if they're not in perfect line with the Father, here's what happens. We're following somebody when they... When they stop, you stop. Now the scripture says, in Genesis, we read it, it says don't look back and don't stop. Very specific, don't look back and don't stop. But see, first you have to stop. Because what happens when you stop? You turn around and look. Because see, if whoever you're following is not in perfect line with God, when they turn, you're going to turn. Because see, you don't have a relationship with God. You're going on what they're doing. We can't go on what somebody else is doing. See, that's the reason why the Bible says to study to show yourself approved, a workman rightly dividing the word of truth. Because see, this way, when you're following them and you sit and say, no, mm -mm, no, they make it a turn. No, uh, no, I can't follow you. I can't follow you. No, I can't follow you. You ain't doing right. Why? Because you see their lifestyle. See, lifestyle. Because see, when you see them on the, when, when you see somebody outside of the church, they should be the same way. But how many times do we see Christians, and I'm talking about those, I'm talking about those ones who say they Christians and in the church house, they in the church house and they say, oh girl, did you see, I seen such and such at the club last night. Now, how would you see her if you ain't there? So how can you put your mouth on anybody? So see, that tells me right there, you following her, she ain't doing right, so you ain't doing right. Because you following the wrong person. Now listen to, now listen to what it says in 1 Corinthians 11 and 1. Listen to what it says in 1 Corinthians 11 and 1. This is King James Version. It says, be ye followers of me, even as I also am a follower of Christ. Now, Paul is very specific here. I love Paul because Paul got deep on you. Paul says, follow me as long as I'm following God. He says, but if I get off of God, you don't follow me. You keep on the path that you was on. See, that's proper following. Because see, in other words, you watch my lifestyle. There's what Paul was saying. You watch my lifestyle. And if I start to veer off, don't follow me anymore. Because I'm just going to lead you astray. And see, don't forget, Paul also said that the things I left behind... I count it as loss for the kingdom, the past. See, looking back, because he's saying, in other words, that stuff don't matter no more to me. The reason why we keep looking back, 
just like Lot's wife, because something there in Gomorrah, she didn't want to leave. See, there was something there she didn't want to leave. See, there was something in Gomorrah that she was enjoying. The Bible don't say, but why else would she look back unless there was something back there that she was enjoying herself. So see, we always must make sure that we're following the right people. Now, let's go to point, point A under point number two. And it's called, and it's looking forward. Now, looking forward. Okay, now we're following. Everybody here see a horse race? Okay, if you've ever seen a horse race, then you know that when they get them in those stalls, if you notice they have blinders on each side of their head. Why? Because for distraction reasons. So they're not distracted, so they can only concentrate on what's in front of them. That's what we need to do in the spirit realm is put our spiritual blinders on. This way, when we're following someone, we can't get distracted on what's to the left or to the right, but we can concentrate straight ahead. Because you know, when, we're fo- when we're looking forwards and we're listening, now what happens is first we stop. Now, when we get to listening, We turn because we have to look at what we're listening to. Now, in the spirit realm, we don't realize we've turned. So we start walking again. Now, when we do this, we just aborted our process. When we look back and start listening to our past, we just aborted the process that God has been trying to do through us. And I don't care how long it's been. We just aborted that process. Why? Because we have decided to listen to this voice. We had to stop, turn, and listen. Now, this is what we're, this is our God now. Because God says, I need you to come be followers of me, not followers of my past. Because see, the Bible says that we are new creation, new, all things. All things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. That means when you truly come down and commit, you truly get rid of your mess, that is no longer there. That is no longer there. So why do we keep it there for? Because what's back there that you love? So much that you feel like you can't live without. Anything that you feel like back here that you can't live without, God says, give it to me and I'll give you something that I guarantee you will be worth more than what you're going on and what you got back there. But see, that's following in a proper way. Because see, you have to be rooted and grounded in your word and in your prayer time to make sure that everything that's going on in our life is in proper alignment. See, so many times we ask God, we say, God, show me. Lord, show me what I need to work on. But we're not asking God to show us. We're doing lip service. He says, the Bible says, he he told the Pharisees, they honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. See, so many times we give God lip service. When we're trying to walk forwards, we give God lip service. Why? Because we don't really want to deal with that. So we're just trying to please God and hopefully that God will give us some peace and God will allow us to, to do what we want to do. No, God ain't going to hear us. Why? Because we don't, because we're truly not trying to follow him. See, when it boils down to it at the end, the only thing that matters is where you truly stand with God. I had a vision here months, about a year or so back. And God had to straighten me out through this vision. Because I'm telling me. And here I am walking towards hell. Literally, I am walking in hell. Walking on the path into hell. And I look to the right. And I look behind me. And I see these souls around me. 
and they're all in white, pure white. And God says, those are church folks who was on their way to hell because they don't truly serve me. See, God either wants all of our heart or none of it at all because God ain't going to take leftovers. God don't do leftovers. God either wants us all or he wants none of us. That's just the way it is because that's the reason why we have to put our best foot forward and say, okay, God, I'm in this all the way. Regardless of what pain I got to suffer, regard, like, like the song says, a true yes. See, a true yes. Because when you give God that true yes, then God's going to open up everything. He gonna, he's, what he's going to do is he's going to take that broom and he's going to clean out the attic. And he's going to get those little dust bunnies that's hidden in those corners. And he's going to say, now, see this? Deal with it. Back to the altar you go. I need you to deal with this sister. I need you to deal with this daughter. I need you to deal with this son. This is what I need you to deal with. To keep looking forwards. Because see, anything that we deal with, if we listen to it, it hinders our forward progress to God. Anything that we listen to in our past, if we start listening to it, it hinders our forward progress. See, the Bible says to cast off every weight. A weight makes it hard for you to walk forwards. It's hard to have a forward momentum with weight on you. That's the reason why when God shows you something, you have to get rid of it. Why? Because it allows you to build momentum. It allows, see, the Bible says that the race ain't to the quick or to the strong, but it's the one that can endure to the end. Just like we've all heard the story of the rabbit and the hare. We've all heard that. Why did the turtle win? Because he was in to the end. He never gave up. He never gave up. He said, hey, I may be slower than the rest of y'all, but I'm going to make it there one way or another. That's the way we need to be with our forward momentum. Hey, I don't care what God needs to show me. Show me, yes, it's going to hurt. Yes, I'm going to fight against that. We're not, I'm not going to say that we're not going to fight against it. We're going to put up a fight. Because we got to be faced with it. But when we accept it and deal with it, then it allows our forward momentum to get closer and closer to our destiny. Let's go to point B. Point B is to learn. Learn, the, the definition of learn is to gain knowledge. The word of God is full of knowledge and wisdom. It's full because the Bible says that he will show us, reveal to us mysteries. And that mystery is the secrets. But we have to gain that knowledge. That means we have to get in and we have to put work on reading the word. That means we got to shut off our TVs. We got to shut off our cell phones. We got to, we got to shut ourselves. That's why the Bible says, get in your secret place, get into your closet. This way there's no distractions. There's nobody around us, but it's just you and God. This way he can reveal to you the knowledge that you need. Now listen to what second Chronicles seven and 14 says. Second Chronicles, second and 14 says, if my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray, seek my face, turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and I will forgive their sins and heal their land. We've all heard that scripture. But there's one word in there that's in the Bible. Google it over a thousand times and any time a word is in there that many times God is trying to tell us something and that word is the first word in that scripture if 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 my people he didn't say the world he said those of you who call yourself my children the ones of you who come and worship me if you will humble yourselves. But see, too many of us don't want to humble ourselves before God. And I'm going to tell you something. The worst thing in the world is not to humble yourself. 
Because when you don't humble yourself, God will do it for you. And if God does it, it's definitely not going to feel good at all. Because if you've lived in this walk with God long enough, you've done had God humble you once in your relationship with God, with him. And trust me, it don't feel good. If you haven't, keep walking a while. God's going to show you something that you don't want to humble yourself to. And he's going he to humble you in the wrong way. And when you do, that's going to be it. I'm going to finish it out with this, point C. And that's execute. The word execute means to carry out, put into effect. Now, we've gotten the word out of, we've got the revelation out of the word. Now we need to put it into practice. Because if you don't ever put your word into practice, it does you no good. You can have all the biblical knowledge. You can be a theologian and this and that. But if you don't put that word into practice and execute it, it means nothing because it does nobody good. Because the word says, well, the word don't say it, pastor says it all the time. Who in my life has to suffer while I remain the same? Because see, if you don't execute the word, if you don't ever execute the word, who is waiting on you down the line that needs your execution, needs you to execute and put into practice that word so they can get delivered and set free? Proverbs 16 and 3 says, commit your works to the Lord and your thoughts will be established. Commit your works to the Lord and he will establish it. In other words, everything that we're trying to commit, execute, we have to execute it. And when we put it into practice, God says, when you put it into practice, I'll honor it. Then I will do what I need to do in your life. Now the altar is open. The altar is open. What do we keep looking back on? What is it in our life that we keep looking back? Whatever it is, bring it to the altar. Bring it to the altar now. Or may you be here for the first time and you say, I've never given my life to the Lord. Will you come? Whatever it is you need, the altar is open. The altar is here. Get whatever you need from the Lord. commit myself to God if that's you would you come if you need to really recommit your life to God come get it right tonight don't leave here with something in your heart or something in your life